a topic I love to talk about because I've had a, such a huge difference in my practice over the last four years using these regenerative techniques. It began um, in 2011 when I was in Anchorage listening to uh, Dr. Hitzig um, talk, a, show a, a half and half result with and without regenerative techniques with PRP and A cell and it was a huge difference. Now, I don't know if I could say you could get this dramatic a difference in a, in a scar, but it started my brain to think, let me try it out. So I started with, and I have no financial affiliation with any company I, I, I'm gonna present. Uh, I don't make any money on my books. I don't make any money on the course. So just to keep that, uh, no, no real disclosures. I started with Autelogel, and I've gotten great results with this. I will not say this is a bad product. It, I think all the PRPs to a large extent work well. I switched over about two, three years ago over to the Angel system only because I'm able to get as much quantity and quality as I can, I can muster at the same cost to me. Um, and the general concepts that uh, one guy, Bob Reese, advocates is to have your PRP or your platelet concentration about 1.8 to 2.5 times physiologic. Is that gospel? No. Actually, I was just in Chicago talking to my colleagues and they, some people do a 5x concentration of platelets. Some people don't think it matters. Some people believe by the time you actually get the concentration and go and take it out to a lab, you get a little variability. So now I'm not as, as dogmatic to say it has to fall in this range, but I do titrate it based on talking to the scientific head um, at the company uh, based on this chart, which you don't have to memorize. Uh, it's just the concept of getting the titration a little bit more concentrated with platelets. I was actually um, uh, listening to a lecture by Scalfani um, at my Facial Plastic Academy about the use of platelet poor plasma. And his argument is that the bioactivity of PPP is very similar to PRP. So I actually have the PPP, platelet poor plasma, and I use that in non-critical areas, such as the donor area. And I have a lot of it in this. I have about 10 or 15 cc's that I inject into the donor incision be before I close it and after I close it. Uh, A-Cell, uh, Matristem Micrometrics, A-Cell is the company. Matristem um, is the product. It is a porcine uh, product. It has, it's acellular in the sense that the cells have been taken out and it's just this extracellular matrix. Micrometrics refers to the type of this product. It is a um, powder product. You can also have it in strips and you can have different fine powders and different milligrams. I typically just use the AMM uh, at, at 100 milligrams. I mix the whole thing with PRP. How do I do it? I'll give you my little recipe here. So my mix for this, for surgery, is going to be, I usually pull out 120 cc's of whole blood and I spin that with a 7% hematocrit because according to the scientific head it gives me the best concentration of active platelets because the blood is not so, so big a deal because you're injecting in an area that has blood. Um, but you want to pull out some of the pro-inflammatory cells such as white cells. So this mix is what I've been told works well, it seems to work well. Uh, in, in my hands. So w with that 120 cc's of spun blood, I get about 35 cc's of usable PRP and about 20 cc's of platelet poor plasma on, in general. And then I take 15 cc's of the PRP, sorry, I take the full 35 cc's, mix it with 100 milligrams of the AMM, the A cell micro matrix, and uh, just sort of clean, uh, swirl it up. I have the whole um, recipe shown in uh, the, the volume one second edition of my book uh, in video format. And then I typically put about 20 cc's in the recipient area, unless it's a confined recipient area, then I may just put in 15 or 10 and I'll put the rest on the graphs. And you say, what do you mean put the rest on the graphs and when do you inject it in recipient sites? The answer to that is I inject it subcutaneously just a little bit at a time, just a little bit all over the, the field right after I do the recipient sites. If you, if you say, well, do you have to do after recipient sites before? I've done it before and after, and they, it both works well. So the reason I do it afterwards is that I can get a lot of the tumescent fluid out, and then I, I feel it's more concentrated. But when you do that, wear goggles, because there's little holes that can squirt up the, the, the um, blood product for, into your face. Um, and then uh, the, the graphs, I don't know if you know this, that PRP can stay stable for about 8 to 12 hours at room temperature, 
it should not be chilled per se because it, it loses the bioactivity. So what I'll do is I have all my graphs um, in my storage medium, which is hypothermosol and uh, ATP, which we'll talk about in a second to how I do that. Um, and I'll have the, right before placement, I'll, I'll code all the graphs um, before I place them with the PRP and A cell mixture. Uh, that is the, the last step before insertion so that it's starting to move toward closer to room temperature during placement. Uh, so that's just how I do it there. By the way, if I'm uh, using it for a smaller case, like a very small hairline, or I may just pull 60 cc's of blood, in which case this is, is the same mixture as you're seeing here, which I get about 18 cc's of usable PRP. And, and in this case, what I'm demonstrating is I'm using uh, the whole mixture with uh, the, the A cell and placing it with a one to five ratio. And again, that's gestalt. You don't have to have be so precise, about one fifth of a syringe, I put some calcium gluconate in there. Why do that? Because you have to activate the PRP in some format. So if I'm making surgery, the recipient sites is a mechanical activation. I don't necessarily need to chemically activate it, but in some way you, you should activate it. And if I don't do recipient sites, again, this slide shows without surgery, then I may also derma roll it to further improve things. So the point of the slide is you have to activate your PRP mechanically, either with a derma roller or recipient sites or chemically using calcium gluconate or thrombin. Um, I don't use thrombin just because there's been some reports of anaphylaxis. I used to use it. I just use calcium gluconate. Do you need both chemical and mechanical? No. One pathway typically is enough. Um, if someone is, is just thinning and I'm worried about how much shedding that goes on, I may not derma roll them. The other question is how often are you supposed to do this without surgery, okay? And, and I will tell you there is not a right answer. I've tried everything under the sun. I don't have a perfect formula for this. Uh, if someone can do this about every couple months for about three or four rounds, I'll do it. If someone says it's too much, I, I, can, I can do it just maybe once have them come back in a year and evaluate them. My colleague Jerry Cooley believes that if you, the rate of loss dictates the, the rate of frequency. So if, if they're really stabilized at every other year or every year, then he doesn't do it as frequently. Um, there is no right formula. And even though I've just shown you my mixture, as I told you, my previous mixtures that I used to use worked well too. So, but I believe, despite all the voodoo that seems like what I'm saying, this, all these products work extremely well in my hands and I really, really, will tell you I don't want to do a surgical transplant without these products and I make no money from this. I don't try to sell a patient with, with more products. I, I, I just include in the cost and I'm not, I don't make any money from the companies. I wish I did, but I actually turn it down because I want to be able to be scientifically clean when I tell you this stuff works. Um, the, uh, this is just PRP and A cell in the front, I'm oh, sorry, in the back. And then this is just showing you a, a gentleman that I got poor growth on back when I was just deciding whether to add PRP and A-cell, and then I added it and I got an explosion of growth. Uh, same thing here, had a little bit spotty growth, and then I don't know if you can see this as well, but I got incredibly good growth after that. And the same thing here, this was all in that transitional phase when I was deciding should I use it, because you know that sometimes you don't get great growth. You do everything right and it doesn't grow as well. I see that this concept espoused by my colleague Marcelo Pichon, which is called personal growth index or PGI, which is predicated on your anatomy, the patient's anatomy, not on the surgeon's uh, abilities. So there is a def he found that using a long hair transplant, he does a hair mass index to quantify how much grows after, because he uses long hairs when he transplants, he quantifies that hair mass index nine months later, and he finds that in the same surgeon's hands, a person that grows 70% grows 70%. Someone grows 95% grows 95% consistently with every surgery. I find what explodes the notion of PGI, in my opinion, are these revolutionary products that truly make a, a large impact in the patient's outcomes. Um, I, I really prefer using them. I started using um, liposomal ATP and hypothermosol um, about a year or two ago, and I'll tell you that I was equivocal. I don't know if it made a big difference, and I was starting to use them. And then um, I was speaking to my colleague, uh, um, Timothy Carmen, who said that he, he had the same experience going through adding ATP as I had adding PRP and A-cell to my formula. And he said, Sam, it's a huge difference. I started to look at my results more carefully. I'm starting to see much less shedding, much earlier growth, much finer growth, where when I was before using PRP and A-cell, I was seeing growth starting around six months. Of course, you can have four and five months, but on average, about six months. I started adding PRP and A-cell. I started seeing better, more consistent growth at about four months. 
Um, and then now with, with uh, ATP hypothermosol, I'm seeing growth at about three months, not on average, but closer to that range with sub sub substantive and more consistent growth. Um, Jerry Cooley did a study where he actually looked at um, uh, graphs that were sitting in a, in a medium of hypothermosol and ATP, and, and the graphs had a 96% take two weeks later ex vivo, sitting in a fridge for two weeks. So I'm really convinced that these products are very, very effective. Now, should you go and rush to buy all this stuff and do the centrifuge? Maybe not. Maybe start with some simple cases. I don't want you to get in love with a lot of the toys, even though I do believe these things are helpful, but I think it's important to just start small and, and don't get crazy with this. So basically, I use these four products, okay? How do I mix my hypothermosol and ATP? Um, you can take a photo of this if you like, but I basically buy my ATP, um, the little V stands for vesicular or liposomal. So I buy my ATP in 50 cc quantity, I mix it with 100 cc's of the hypothermosol. Uh, and, 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 sorry, I take 50 cc's of ATP, I have 100 cc's of hypothermosol, that's how it comes packaged. I take 10 cc's of the ATP out and mix it with 100 cc's of hypothermosol. Um, I take 50, that, a 50 cc mixture of that concoction for my strip. And so my strip tries, it, it is, tries to stay in ATP hypothermosol as long as possible. You say, well, do you then switch it over to plasmalite ATP? Yes, but the concept is the less time, the, the more time early on from getting it ex vivo in a stable medium that you can do, the more critical. As the window continues, it's not as critical to keep it in the hypothermosol um, con uh, uh, mixture. So then um, I also take the other 50 cc's of that ATP hypothermosol mix and I split into the bowls for the slivering. And then when my girls are working with the dissection of the grafts, they're using an ATP plasma-like uh, uh, mixture. So um, the concept of the ATP is that it actually stabilizes the sodium potassium ATP pump so you don't get intracellular flooding and, and, and engorgement and then therefore lysis and death. So the other part of my 40 cc's of ATP, remember I'm pulling the, out of the 50 cc's on the first row, okay, I've taken 10 of the ATP here, I've taken the rest of the 40 and mix it with 400 cc's of plasmolite. I'll use 100 cc uh, spray uh, for the patient afterwards and the rest of the 300 cc's is, is the soaking medium and I also use for spray bottles when I spray the scalp. Patients spray themselves every hour postoperatively for uh, five days, um, but the first two days are the, are the most important. I now have the patients wake up every one or two hours to spray. I believe that the ATP during that critical window is like a CPR for the grafts. Um, so that's what I do. And then after the first two days, whatever they have left, I say just drain the, drain the ATP bottle and just finish it off. So stem cells, there's been some, some early studies that show that you know, adipocytes don't really have a big impact at current stage for hair growth, um, but it's just something to um, uh, explore further in. Um, I use this Microsoft product, which I really believe is awesome. That's why they're here as a vendor. I don't make any money off them. They don't pay me to do anything, uh, but I, I really like this product. And what this does is that it kills almost 100% of all the bacteria, HIV, um, all the fungus, everything, and it's completely non-toxic because it simulates how our body kills all these organisms. So you can get it in your mouth, your eyes, it won't hurt. So all my patients get sprayed down with this beforehand, before a surgery. Um, if there's any infections, and I, if it's an infection, you can't really treat it because it's usually below the surface of the skin. Um, there's a hydrogel version they have that can help with acne. But generally, I use the, the, this aerosol version just to spray on everything, all the surfaces before I start working around their scalp. When I do inject products, I use this to, to um, kill everything before I start. It's again non-toxic and, and, and it kills all these wonderful organisms. So I really believe that these bioenhancement or regenerative medicine techniques have been very instrumental in improving my results and, and getting consistency and it's one of the major impetus uh, for me going back and rewriting my first volume and including those uh, formulations in there. Again, I make no money on my books.